the thing about hip hop uh, today is it's smart. It's insightful. The, the way that they can communicate uh, a complex message in a very short space is, is remarkable. And a lot of these kids, they're not going to be reading the New York Times. That's not how they're getting their information. My hip hop will rock the shop the nation. Hip hop culture is more than music. Peace to you. We speak the truth. Show them what peace can do when they're raised for you. My hip hop will rock the shop the nation. Rap is something you do. Hip hop is something you live. So hip hop didn't invent anything. But hip hop reinvented everything. Peace and love, everyone. My name is Manny Faces. For 10 years, I covered hip hop music and culture in and around New York City as an independent journalist and content creator. Despite the attention the mainstream music business started giving to areas outside of hip hop's mecca, New York remained a thriving, bubbling, evolving artistic and cultural ecosystem. This includes many people and organizations who use hip hop in incredibly innovative and inspirational ways outside of just making music and entertaining folks. In areas like education, in schools, in youth outreach and counseling, in theater, in science and technology, in politics and activism, hip hop is a remarkable force in New York and beyond. The voices of these innovators are as important as ever, especially as corporations continue to strip away hip hop's wider cultural voice for the sake of profits. Because these innovators know how to use the nation's dominant youth culture in an authentic manner, in ways that can help solve some of our nation's biggest problems. So we need to celebrate and support them. Because I believe that hip-hop can save America. And so this podcast was born. Thanks again for joining me as I talk to the folks who are responsibly using hip-hop music and culture to address, adjust, and in some cases, alleviate problems facing our country. Hip Hop Can Save America is a presentation of the Center for Hip Hop Advocacy at hiphopadvocacy.org, a nonprofit dedicated to increasing public understanding of hip hop culture. We're also brought to you by the award winning Newsbeat Podcast. It's hard hitting journalism, including interviews with thought leaders and activists about the most pressing social justice issues of our time. And it also incorporates hip hop with music and original lyrical contributions every episode. Think of it as Democracy Now! and Black Thought had a podcast, baby. You can find Newsbeat by Maury Creative Studios wherever you get your podcasts or on the web at usnewsbeat.com. Hip Hop Can Save America airs weekly, Tuesdays at 10 p.m. on Bonfire Open Source Radio. With amazing programming like their flagship morning show, TK in the AM, Bonfire Open Source Radio is leading community radio into the future. Check them out at bonfireradio.com or on the TuneIn app. We're also available on most podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Stitcher. Now, on this episode, I speak to artist, educator, and entrepreneur Gil Perkins, a.k.a. Sage Salvo, who founded a literacy program called Words Live that helps teachers build standards-aligned lessons that integrate music and media, increasing student engagement and educational success. In our talk, Sage details the core offerings of this groundbreaking program and speaks about how hip-hop music and lyrics can help students better understand complex literary works. Now, what I love about this episode is that sometimes when I talk to people far outside of hip-hop and I suggest that hip-hop can be a wonderful tool to improve on an outdated, often ineffective education system to help increase literacy and understanding of subjects like Shakespeare, the response is often filled with skepticism. Then I tell them about people like Sage Salvo and programs like Words Live, and all that changes. So here it is, my conversation with Sage Salvo. So listen, uh, just to kick things off, uh, as as many of us do, I'm, I'm sure you do as well, wear many hats, uh, you know, so just yep. if you could just kind of, where, where do you, how do you currently define yourself, you know, from a professional standpoint today? Uh, from a professional standpoint, certainly an educator, probably first and foremost. Secondly, entrepreneur, building my own company, building other companies as well, putting products in the market, products in the schools, and then a manager. Uh, as we've been able to grow, I've, I've had to wear several business hats just within the startup, within Words Live. Mm. So I've had to manage the product development cycle. I've had to manage the financing cycle. I had to manage the marketing and sales cycle. So it's, it's uh, even within the startup, there's just so many hats that, that, that I'm currently wearing. So yeah, it's man. good, man. It's, it's honestly, it's all good. That's many hats, but, but you're in touch with everything. So, you know, there's something to be said for that. You, you got your hands on every aspect of what you're doing. So learning. Um, yeah, 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 I hear that. 
when talking about various ways that hip hop and education cross paths, I, I actually frequently use your example, some examples from your TED talk, I guess back in like 2012 or whatever. Oh, forever ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you describe some of the foundational thoughts of some of your work with with Words Live and, you know, the amount of connections that could be drawn between modern hip hop lyrics and, and more traditional classic literature, mm -hmm. all the literary devices at play. I use those examples a lot for the very unfamiliar. Uh, what's your typical kind of elevator pitch, so to speak, for for those who might scoff at the notion that that rap holds any value uh, from a literary standpoint? Yeah, for those that scoff, man, it, it's like there's honestly no genre. It's uh, this whole idea about division, where we divide up classical literature versus contemporary versus you know music, is actually just a false distinction. Um, what's been persistent across hundreds of years, our literary devices, our grammar structure, and even the themes that human beings go through. So you can draw direct connections between the very same themes that are affecting our life right now in 2018, to some of the themes that were affecting the lives of folks who lived in 18 AD. Right? Right. It's, just, it's just things that are common to the human experience. And then there's something about language that has very persistent uh, structures. And one of my favorite philosophers when we started this work was, uh, was Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chomsky's earlier work, before he got into politics more so, his earlier work was around grammar. And he was uh, effectively a linguistics expert. And something that he would all often posit was just this universal grammar, which is effectively there's something almost biological about language for human beings. Mm -hmm. And it's very persistent. It's so organic to us that it's almost like an offshoot of our biology. And so from that perspective, man, again, you can draw, draw consistent lines throughout our languages, different languages, and across the time as language develops. So people that just try to act like this is such a, a renegade, non-art, you know, no standard, no conformity. Like, it's just absolutely wrong. They haven't actually evaluated, you know, hip-hop right, lyrics. Right, so, for sure. Yeah. So, again, those examples, the kind of work that you do. Explain a little bit, if you could, the, uh, the Words Live program, how that helps demonstrate this and then apply it in the classroom or, you know, or, or in workshops and such. Yeah, so just to extend from what I was just saying, we took the position of hip-hop, the last 40 years of it, um, if you take the body of work of lyrics... It constitutes its own literary point in time. Like if you put everything on the spectrum, you know, classical, neoclassical, romantic period, all et cetera, if you put everything on the spectrum, hip hop since the early 70s and since today, it constitutes its own literary uh, moment because it has consistent themes, consistent motivation, a specific orientation point, and a specific aesthetic to it. Um, so it therefore just comports, comports to every other themed period of, of, of literary history that we're right. taught. And those are sort of the, the attributes of a, of a literary period, right? Right, are, yeah. exactly. If you so want to study it, the Elizabethan it has all period. The, it checks all the boxes. It checks all the boxes. Got it. And again, you only see that, though, once you break down that wall of, of, of genre and say, well, this is just music, so it can't be. So what we do is we purposely place this right next to and in tandem with uh, all the things that we're studying in schools. Now, the reason we do this is A, there's the elevate the art form. I think the art form has been uh, relegated to something that, uh, like a low level art form, when it's not, particularly when you have people like Nas, Rakim, that, that are even more sophisticated than the, the authors we're reading in school. That's a whole other discussion. Right, right. And certainly <laughs> on the mainstream level, the distinction that, you know, obviously these kind of artists exist, but it's certainly not, you know, prevalent in the overall entertainment industry. Right. Right. And I think that's, I think that's what the problem is, right? Like, right. You look at like, you know, bubblegum pop type music and you say, OK, well, yeah, this isn't, you know, sophisticated enough from a literary perspective. But if that's your only view mm. of the art form, then yeah, you're missing like 80 of percent of the good stuff, man. It'd be so. it'd be saying, you know, if, if all you know is Dr. Seuss and you don't know Shakespeare. That's it, exactly you right. Have any, any, you would be like, OK, yeah. not a lot of great literature coming out of, <laughs> you know, Europe and America in the 1800s. So that's right. exactly right. Yeah. And so what we do, man, is we, we've noticed that our generation, our neighborhoods, our cities, the places where you get a lot of black, Latino, urban, very diverse energy, like we're creating very sophisticated compositions. Sometimes it's actually with the help of people you study in the classroom, but a lot of times it just, it's just coming from our musical influences. You know, these mm. artists that are writing these complex compositions. And so we could, my question to myself was if I could find a way 
to sort of systemically integrate these these songs and these compositions into the traditional classroom text, then I might be able to help a lot of kids learn. And uh, that that was really the genesis, man. That's that's really that's really how we started a couple of years back in the DC area. What were you doing at the time that you were figuring this out? Funny story. I was teaching at Howard University. I was doing a PhD in economics and I was young. I was like dumb young. I was like 26 years old and mm. I was asked to teach. So I started teaching freshman classes. And I'm just like, yo, I'm not that old, you know, not, not that much older than them. You know, I'm like 26, 27 to 18. And I'm like, there's such a, it seems like there's such a drop off of like just writing skills and communication skills. And, mm. And uh, I asked questions about comprehension, and you know, it just it, it wasn't there. And I was like, "Wow, like what's going on in high schools now? Has it changed so drastically?" Right. And so I started volunteering in the high schools around Howard. And this is uptown DC. If anybody yeah. knows, like the U Street area, Howard University area. Yeah, for sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm volunteering. And I'm like, "Yo, this is some dire situations happening, man. It's yeah. even worse than when I was in school." Right. And so I was like, right, "I got to find a way to um to give teachers strategies to really elevate some of these competencies." And it just so happens at the same time, I was writing songs. I put out a mixtape. I was a, you know, my hobby was, was songwriting and, and performance. But I also was hosting a spot called Bus Boys and Poets. I love DC. that place. Yeah, everybody that came to DC know about Bus Boys Man, and Poets. Listen, so. <laughs> I just got put on like late last year. I, you know, a I word. Think, yeah, because we go down there for this other podcast that we do. So my guy, my guy actually worked for the Post down there, and he was like, "I got to take you to this place. You're gonna love it." It's right up your alley, Manny. And I said, yeah, and it was. <laughs> hey, man, next time you're in the city, man, we got a link. That's, that's, yeah, that's my yeah, spot. I didn't even my know people. you were right around there, yeah. That's hey, that's my people over there. That's and uh, So I had the good fortune, man, of, of hosting an open mic there. And as you know, a lot of talent comes through there. When you come to D.C., if you're a traveling poet or yeah. performing artist, a lot of people hit up that, that open mic. And so I was just wrestling with, like, yo, these, I'm seeing these people from all over the country. You know, great spoken word artists, great poets. They have these amazing ability to communicate and even like adapt their pieces in real time. I'm seeing God, cause when you host the mm. open mic, you do show after show after show. Right. So sometimes it might be the same featured artist, but you'll see that artist kind of change it up mm. based on who they think is in the audience. And I'm like, yo, this is masterful. Okay. And I was like, yeah. if I could give my kids like a set, like just a, a taxonomy set of these communication skills, it would a help them to communicate better themselves, but it would also help them read um, and increase their comprehension when they come across, you know, figurative language and, certain literary structure. So I was like, yo, I, I got to figure out how to match this. And that's when I started just <laughs> kind of renegade style going into classrooms. I had no company. I, I don't even think I filled out like waivers, man. I was just like getting invited <laughs> in. And right. teachers were like, yo, come take my class over for an hour. Like, you know, kind of just doing it like that, guerrilla style. So mm. that that's how it started. And it, it morphed because at some schools, I was going back so much that they were like, yo, like legally, you need to be a vendor or something. Like, we can't, <laughs> right, right. can't keep bringing a random dude. You ain't even a substitute. So, <laughs> <Gotcha. laughs> so yeah, that's, that's kind of how we had to like then turn that into a, a startup company. That's interesting. Actual so company. you kind of it kind of happened organically. It's not like you were maybe becoming aware of the cultural relevant pedagogy movement or anything like that. Right. That's, that's yeah. very true. Like I was mm. totally absent from that. Right. You know, I was I was literally, literally just intent on like, how can I equip my kids better? Like I was in that bubble. I, I really wasn't into the whole movement that was going on around me. I just it just wasn't my space. Right. Right. So how did it evolve since then? Like so. So after doing that and putting it together sort of as this structured you know, less what I like, I'll cut myself off. What I like is that you also involve now technology. So it's, it's lesson yeah. plans, but you have this online component and it's very tech, you know, based it's, it's rooted in tech. So you're actually bringing another whole world of competency into this, uh, hip hop slash education world. How, how does the system work? How, how, do, how do you bring it online? How does the tech factor play in? Man, the tech factor is big. So what was happening was about a, about two years into just doing that work as a program. Right? I'm going around the schools, going around the school districts, kind of, you know, making a name for myself, did a TED Talk, all of that. Yep. And um, I had a few really pivotal meetings with education leaders that were like, yo, you, you're so focused and you're in this bubble, but you're not going to be able to reach all the kids that actually need this kind of work. Okay. I started thinking about it. I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, how do you I scale it? How do I scale it, right? Yeah. Like, what does that look like? And so that's when the technology question comes in. I know right now, like, it's the default. It's the hot thing. But for me, it honestly didn't make sense until I had figured out what am I doing that's been so effective? And then how many kids are not going to be able to get it if I don't figure out 
how to scale it. I think now most people are like, yo, I got a good idea. I'm about to hit, you know, I'll get a million followers. Like it's like instantly. Whereas my, my, my perspective is more like master the thing that is valuable and then decide or figure out who else needs it or who else should have it. Okay. So, Quality over quantity. and something. Yeah, man. There's different motivations in that, but particularly right. when it comes to education, man, I, I think you, it's such an intimate experience, man. Like, learning from someone you're mm. undergoing some type of system where you're in a grade like just think about how intimate that is day in and day out you're reading you're being evaluated you're being challenged it's it's too intimate for me to have had like these knee-jerk reactions about yo i need 60 million you know subscribers. <laughs> it just right. it didn't feel right right it gotcha. didn't feel right i was like i, I want to help a certain kind of student and right. uh, okay you know I, I was intent on doing that so we just built the business up we took heed to the, the messages we were getting from the school leaders and we were like, okay, I think I think we can bottle up what we've been effective with, but if we're gonna do a platform, then a the platform has to really alleviate the burden that teachers have. And so mm-hmm. this is the real value of the platform, I think. It's not just enabling culturally responsiveness, integrating music and lyrics the way we do in programs. I think the real value is that how easy it is for a teacher, for a classroom to do it. Because what we okay. were seeing was teachers were bringing us in effectively to do what they could do they just didn't have confidence <laughs> enough to do it right, right like maybe right. you don't know the music your kids are listening to that's a right, big issue sure. number one right. big issue you're not culturally in tune to them that is a huge issue yeah but once you get more levels of comfort with it when you start asking them like yo what are y'all listening to you know like wow let me listen to this too what, what, let me see if i could pull something out of it mm. they could do that themselves it takes longer obviously right. it takes a lot more creativity but effectively, they were just bringing us in to substitute that function. So we said, okay, I'm going to put it back. Right. We're going to bottle up what we do and then give it back to you. Like, you can do this too in four easy steps. And that lets us build out the platform. Right. And like, you know, build a whole lesson plan, integrate all the music, get the video, you get the standards, you get your slide deck, yeah. all your activity, you get all of that in four clicks. And that's um, that was our motivation for building the platform out like that. I think that is important. I mean, you, you mentioned the the teachers having to, you know, this isn't something you could just hand out and say, do this. It's a, it's a interactive thing. It's a, you said to be culturally in tune, like that's almost necessary. Absolutely. And and I think teachers, I mean, a lot of teachers obviously open to this idea and we talk about, you know, all the great advances that hip hop and education are are finding ways to, to be married. But I still think that people still to this day, educational institutions, and some teachers, whether they be old and, and, and not of the community necessarily where, you know, hip hop style or culture is relevant uh, or, pre- or prevalent, but it's also the institutional background behind them. There's hindrances sometimes to accept this as being viable. Absolutely. Right? I'll literally hear, well, you know, no, nah, this is this is probably everywhere because, you know, Hamilton. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it's it's more than that, though. It's more right. than, than just that. What what hindrances <laughs> do you have? I mean, obviously, the teachers getting kind of uh, knowing the, the material a little bit more in depth and then therefore, by extension, I think, understanding their students a little bit better. Um, that's that's important. Do, do teachers push back because they don't believe this is worthy as an art form do they can they get past the fact of you know what they hear on the radio or um or is it because they like you said they may be uncomfortable yep. uh, willing but not comfortable and or do you also get pushed back from institutions the ones that welcome you in obviously hear about it they see what you're doing they want you in but maybe approaching new institutions or, or new places what are some of the challenges you've seen or had to overcome and I, i'll tell you like this there's definitely a barrier and and just can be like general reticence to to accept us. But the places that have black and brown people in leadership, it's much easier because they know it. You know, they're raising mm-hmm. kids themselves and, and they know the music that they listen to themselves. Right. So it's it's like an odd barrier because the music itself and the culture itself is such a participatory culture. Like Hip hop is a participatory culture. If you can't MC. You can produce, you can cut. If you can't DJ or MC, you could dance. If you can't dance, you could be a hype man. Like it's <laughs> it's sure. such a participatory culture that is so odd for me when people feel like they have no connection to it, or they can't do anything about it. Like it's it's the weirdest thing. Mm. And so I just try to emphasize, like, yo, like the one benefit you have is that this culture is very accepting and very participatory. 
you don't have to fake the funk like you know you you got a top five favorite MC list all all of a sudden now right <laughs> like something like that right. but just taking genuine authentic interest in like yo what do you listen to right. why do you think this is dope. Oh, let me actually take an objective listen to this song that you listen to. This artist, like, who is this Cardi B? Right. And I think that's when you can you, you, we get some acceptance into it. But there's just this initial, just thing, man. And I don't know if it's like the media's influence on people who didn't grow up with hip hop or didn't grow right. up in like very diverse culture. It's like this 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 thing you got to get people over. Like it's like this level of comfort that they're like, I can't. I, you know, it's too foreign or, you know, this is weird to me, man. I'm like, right. yo, of all genres, man, this is the most accepting one yeah, that we've ever had. Absolutely. I mean, worldwide, you know, you can, you'll can you see this everywhere. I do think it's a uh, very large part does fall on the media. I actually, I, I kind of lecture about that. <laughs> it's oh, word. That, yeah. And I, I, I put a lot of blame on, on media. Our own media, hip hop media, I think does a pretty horrendous job uh, these days of, mm. you know, pr- pushing some of these other uh, valuable ways that hip hop should be seen. But mainstream media, because that's the one that, you know, gets to all these folks that are outside of the, the bubble of hip hop. Per se, and they've just done a bad job over the years that because they, 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 they don't understand the nuances themselves, and so sure. it, it does create a, a giant feedback loop, I think, of what people think hip hop is, and therefore it's really tough to make that mental leap to, to, to say that there's value, you know, again, literary value, educational value, mm-hmm. uh, being used in therapy, and you know, it's just seen as that 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 barrier is huge. I guess it's getting better in some ways, how so? Well, because you're showing receipts. You know, the more the more people like yourself that have programs that are successful and showing success. Yeah. You know, then you get to now turn around to the institutions that might be reticent or might not have full knowledge and say, well, listen, I don't have to convince you. I just can show you, yep. you know, here are the results. So let me ask you about that. What are some examples of where you've seen the, the, the program that you that you've done, either when you were doing it kind of, <laughs> you know, going out as a as a missionary of sorts, <laughs> uh, you know, or like that. results from from, you know, the more structured here teachers. Y'all, y'all figure it out. Y'all, y'all can do it, too. But like, what are some real like, I guess, heartfelt moments or students that you've seen really go a long way that let you know that, yeah, this this works. And, and this is a great example. Bro, man, like this, so this this is this is the most enduring aspect of doing this kind of work uh for me uh, we i'm gonna give like three quick ones so yeah for sure i was in a high school but it was like young high school like ninth grade and uh you know typically when you go into a class as a guest teacher or your co-teacher and the teacher that is a formal teacher gives you the lay of the lands like okay you know, you're gonna have five students that are really active they're gonna sit up front you're gonna have one that you gotta watch i'm gonna have to be on them and you know they give you the lay of the land in this one classroom, there was a, a student with a, a speech impediment. And so I was kind of directed, like, just don't, you know, don't call on that person. Don't expect much. They'll probably keep their head down the whole time, whatever. Mm. Go through the lesson. And I think we were doing a, uh, I think this was a poetry unit, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was a poetry unit for that class. And actually, uh, yeah, w- one of them was a Shakespearean sonnet. That was actually the source text. But we had used, I think, some, some Kanye that day. But it, it was like a really good, rich unit. And a uh, kid that, that wasn't supposed to talk, he stood up. Not He didn't put his hand up. He just, like, stood up, stood behind his desk. Hmm. And I'm like, all right, you know. And he's not saying nothing. He's just, like, into the lessons. I'm like, all right, cool. He's, he's going to stand. I, I, okay, I, I'll let him stand. Whatever. They, they didn't warn me about this. but I'm Right. Like- <laughs> they told me about this part. He just stood behind his desk, like, arms folded, like, looking. I'm like, okay. Right. And um, he then raises his hand. So I'm like, oh, man. Like, you know, because there's like the embarrassment factor, you know, when you have a speech impediment, it's usually why teachers will tell you, like, don't call on that person, stay away. Mm -hmm. So I had to make a judgment call because he had stood for so long. I kind of felt obligated, like, all right, let me let this brother speak. man. Right. So instead of talking from the back, he walks up to the front of the classroom with me and just starts talking to me directly. And like, but he's pointing like the, the poem is displayed. He starts annotating the lines. He's just talking to me. And I'm like, yo, bro, you're not, you know, you, you're not hesitating. You're not stuttering at all. I was like, yo, tell the class what you what you're telling me, because you're annotating this correctly. Right. And with that, he then turns to class and started breaking down the poem. No stuttering, no hesitation, nothing. Huh. Teacher, teacher loses it. Teacher starts crying right there in the classroom. And uh, I actually kept a contact with the young brother. And it's like moments like that. Wow. Or why you're like, yo, this is. This was just, this is just analyzing text, you know, just doing a close reading. Right. But that day literally changed his life. 
that's the kind of moments and, and things that we're seeing. We go to classrooms where two thirds of the class are failing. Now, I've been in an English class where literally two thirds of the class have a D or lower. Like they're gonna have to repeat. And we go in, we do a couple weeks, whatever the unit, it doesn't matter what the unit, it could be an essay, a speech, a play, a play, it don't, does not matter what the unit is. Once we've redone or remixed the, the curriculum with the music, we'll have, it will have it completely inverted where two thirds of the class will score B's and above. Mm. And that's, that's the level of, of, of impact we've been able to see, man. So our goal now is to put research behind that and study it. In education, you gotta do stuff like longitudinal studies. You gotta track students for a couple of years. You gotta have control groups and all of that. And so right, we're right. putting that in place now so we can be able to make more declarative statements and say, okay, based on our impact, you know, kids were able to increase Right. Average class grades right now because all we have these anecdotes right now. Right, right, right. Like I said, you need the receipts. <laughs> you need the receipts. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, for sure. Wow, that's amazing. That's a that's great. That's moving because you know it really just shows that with the right kind of approach, no student has to be quiet in the back of the room. Yo, man, that's why I say reveal. Our tagline is revealing unexamined genius. Mm. Like that, that we lose out on genius, genius that could be contributed to the world, but we lose out on it because we don't give them an opportunity to perform it. Right, right. From that's from a student point of view. Uh, what about teachers? Like you know, you talk about the teacher obviously also having this kind of profound effect on the teacher as well. Teachers, once they start seeing what this is all about, they is there some revelations that they ha- that you see take over them? Yeah, we got no problems with teachers. So. <laughs> <laughs> teachers say everything from like, "This is why I started teaching. I want to mm. do more of this." We have a uh, we started uh, putting teachers in residence just to have them come in so we can have more intimate dialogue and like actually like incubate them and make sure their voices are heard and, and that they're kind of placing us back into their classrooms. Right. The, the teachers are, and this is another reason why I think operating outside the system can be beneficial. Um, you know, you gotta have your people that work in the system. You gotta have administrators, you gotta have principals, you gotta have teachers. You, you definitely have to have people inside the system. Okay. But folks like me who work outside the system, I think we got a bit of a, a, a different vantage point because I'm so much more freer right. of all of those um, hurdles right. that the teachers have to work through. So a common thing that we get with teachers is like, I wish I could do this on a regular basis. So we you know, push back. Like, Why can't you? Mm. I'm like, well, I got to do this. And I administrator c- c- checks on Wednesdays and I got to be saying there's a line. So we just took all of that and we built it on the platform and said, now what? All of it's right there. Mm, <laughs> you want okay. state standard? Which which state standard do you want? <laughs> you get the pick. Uh, wow. <laughs> like it's all okay. right there. So like the like the common core type stuff is common all kind cores of, on it. there. Got it's it, just, got there it. it's all like we we just took all the hurdles and said, what's preventing teachers from doing this? Because we kept hearing like, oh man, I I wish I could do this more often, or right. I want to be able to do this. Okay, we want to enable you to do this. <laughs> Mm, got it. Got it. Do, do you know how many kind of do you give out numbers like how many schools this is in or how many, uh, you know, h- how expansive the program has been used? Yeah. So we, the it's like kind of there's always two sides of it because there's a programming side that I started with. Right. And then there's the platform app side that we built. Okay. So the app is still new. Right. So we just released this to our pilot testers in the, the last winter, like November. Okay. So this is still pretty new. Right. Uh, but we work with a few school districts, uh, predominantly on the East Coast, Virginia, Maryland, D.C., Pennsylvania. Um, so we're school district at the top right now. Reason being is so we get to customize it at the top level. And then right. any school, any teacher in that school district can use it. What we're going to roll out, though, next year are individual subscriptions. So maybe your school district signs up, maybe they don't. But irregardless, you're going to be able to have an individual subscription yourself okay. as a teacher and we'll customize okay. it to your syllabus. So we're going to roll that out next year. But we started you know, a little bit for validity, a little bit for what you said, getting the receipts. We yeah. started with the superintendent school district office first, customized it. for the whole district. Got it. Once they, once they green light it, you're, you're in good you're shape. You're in good shape. You're, yeah. yeah. It, it, don't, moving down rather than having to fight upward. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and, it's, and it's both. Like I said, we're going to, we're, yep. we're building for the, for, for the uh, bottom up too, but you know. Yeah. 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 Well, even you can tell from the, you know, the teacher feedback and, and, you know, them telling you what they need to, you know, and you adapting the platform to match that, that shows that it's going both ways as well. I think that a lot of people, and I know that you said this earlier, you said, you know, you were, your main goal is kind of to help a certain kind of student or a certain, you know, certain areas. And I know that that's where a lot of the help, most of the help is needed. Some people think that, you know, using hip hop as a, as a, as an educational tool can only be used 
you know, among black and brown kids that have, you know, hip hop in their veins or whatever, <laughs> whatever <laughs> you know, um, but because hip hop is so ubiquitous and, you know, even, you know, white kids in Alabama know hip hop, you know, Absolutely. And, and, and because those fundamental, like you say, those literary device, everything is fundamental in words yes. and, and delivery. What's the universal potential for a program like Words Live and other, other stuff that you do? So it, for Words Live and for any any hip hop based curriculum is universal. I, I was in Chicago just doing a talk. I met uh, an educator from Belgium. Belgium came up and said, I need to bring you to Belgium. <laughs> guy, let's go to Belgium. <laughs> you know, say no more. <laughs> say no more. Let's go to Belgium. I, I went down with, uh, so this is actually an interesting trip. I was part of the U.S. delegate that went down with Ivanka Trump to India in November as part of the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. Oh, okay. I mean, out in India, Indians like, yo, we need this, you know, like <laughs> we got to bring you back to India. So we talking to folks in India and they, they got a good group teach for uh, teach for India kind of model after teach for America over here. So it, it, it's automatically worldwide. Like you're you're right. you're, you're in an automatically globally knit network right, uh, once right. you, when you start to move into this world. And a lot of it has to do with just the appeal and how hip hop has been exported globally. Yeah, for sure. You know, it has no balance. Again, being supremely participatory, it's inviting different cultures, different languages. Man, you get ill rappers in Hindu, ill rappers in Chinese. I mean, it's real. It's just, it is what it is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. I think it's uh, Tony Blackman talks about, you know, just you, a cipher look like a cipher, no matter where you are in the world. <laughs> you know what it is. They, That's they right. stand around and they, and they know how to get into it. You don't have to even speak the language in a dance cipher, for example. You just, you just know it's, it's this universal Mm-hmm. togetherness you know that that does you know permeate the world man so that's a great way to great way to do it i guess we're about to wrap I, I, i'm gonna let you go in a minute i want to ask you one final question you actually told me kind of like where you guys are going with the with the program so we covered that the name of this podcast is hip-hop can save america yeah <laughs> and it may be a lofty theory and i know that we need a lot more than just hip-hop but let me ask from your perspective why is it important or what are the best reasons uh, that you think people should consider hip hop, music, and culture when looking for ways to truly improve lives and livelihoods and communities in this country. I think for a lot of reasons that we were just talking about, which is there's a natural element of participation in it, and I think that's that's probably a, a lot of what's what's ailing us right now. Right? There's these divisions. There's mm. this, you stay over there, I'm gonna stay over here. Right, right. Nope, I'm on this set, and, and never the two shall clash. But with hip hop, man, the culture is like it's going to invite you. You know, like like I said, if you can't dance, you could just be a, a hype man. You know what I mean? You might be able to produce and cut. Like it's just it's so many ways to get involved, right. and it's just naturally participatory. That I think the nature of collaboration is a saving article. Like that's something that can save societies. That's something that can save nations. It's like this instinct to collaborate more than you know just to conflict and separate. So I I, I, I think there's something there. I think there's a lot there. Mm. what you're saying i think though because of what you also said the media's portrayal of the culture in the art form you'd be hard pressed to be able to make that like a a a blank statement solution and have people pick it up and adopt it but i think that could definitely be like the byline of some type of campaign like it it could be the unspoken thing that we all know is all right we we know what time it is yeah right right right. we we got some explaining to do to the rest of the absolutely (laughs) it's right that's right Well, that's why we're doing this. You know, that's why I'm talking to you. I recognize what you do to, you know, further that notion. I love that uh, it does two things, as a lot of hip hop education stuff does. It obviously helps students learn things better. And that's a great goal and it's noble and we need it and it works. The other thing is you help reinforce the idea that hip hop is more than the bubblegum rap pop stuff that's on the radio or the misogynistic, violent drivel, blah, blah, blah. You're doing both and you're teaching it to students which means the parents find out about that. True. The teachers find out about it, and that helps get the message out to the greater public. So That's all right. of these efforts, I think, work in conjunction. You know, But you're out there fighting a the good fight, so I want to talk about it, man. I appreciate you uh, for your work and your perspective and for your time. Hey, man. Salute, man. You as well. I appreciate your time, man. Thanks for this platform. It's definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely needed. I'm, I'm doing what I can, my man. I'm doing what I can. And next time I'm in D.C., we definitely going to link up. I was going to say, man. Yeah, don't, don't, come back, don't come back to the city without me, man. I mean, nah. My folks over there. So, yeah. Hip Hop Can Save America is a presentation of the Center for Hip Hop Advocacy at hiphopadvocacy.org. 
nonprofit dedicated to increasing public understanding of hip hop culture. We're also brought to you by the Newsbeat Podcast, hard hitting journalism, including interviews with thought leaders and activists about the most pressing social justice issues of our time. It also incorporates hip hop with music and original lyrical contributions every episode. Think of it as Democracy Now! and Black Thought had a podcast baby. Find Newsbeat by More Creative Studios wherever you get your podcasts or on the web at usnewsbeat.com. Hip Hop Can Save America with Manny Faces airs weekly Tuesdays at 10 p.m. on Bonfire Open Source Radio. With amazing programming like their flagship morning show TK in the AM, Bonfire Open Source Radio is leading community radio into the future. Check them out at bonfireradio.com or on the TuneIn app. Hip Hop Can Save America is created and hosted by me, Manny Faces. I also produce the theme music. Special thanks to our associate producer, Summer McCoy. You can find out more about me at mannyfaces.com. And find out more about Summer's hip-hop and tech-related initiative, Hip Hop Hacks, at hiphophacks.com. Thank you for listening.